Welcome to ALD Stories, a series chronicling the personal journeys of the people behind atomic layer deposition, untold stories of the technology, and deep dives into the history, development, and future of ALD. I'm your host, Tyler Myers, bringing you this podcast from Benick, the home of ALD. In episode 21, ALD Stories takes one giant leap for podcast kind and reaches the final frontier. Pasadena, California. Okay, okay, we're not exactly in space, but our guest this month, Dr. John Hennessy, was among the ranks of those who are making that possible. Joining us from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, the institution responsible for several exploratory space robotics, including the Perseverance and Curiosity Mars rovers. John himself at JPL developed ALD processes that are used to fabricate ultraviolet optical coatings for astronomical imaging applications. These fluoride-based coatings are applied as anti-reflective and encapsulation films on telescope components like image sensors and mirrors to improve their sensitivity to ultraviolet light, a critical parameter that allows us to capture an even larger eclipse of the photonic photo album that is our universe. Now, as far as cool conversations go, this one is completely sub-zero. John gives me a look into JPL's relationship with NASA, why UV coatings are so important, and how they've improved since their use in the Hubble Space Telescope. We also touch on how JPL tests the readiness for coatings for eventual launch and what new mission concepts are currently being evaluated at NASA. For me, this conversation makes me completely marvel at what humans have made possible and really proud that our technology gets to be part of it. I hope that it may do the same for you. So please grab your tea or coffee and enjoy episode 21 of ALD Stories podcast with John Hennessy from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of ALD Stories. I'm Tyler, and I'm here with John Hennessy from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, or JPL. Uh, we have a really cool topic to talk about today. We're going to be discussing ALD for ultraviolet coatings and their applications in space technology. Uh, John, it's really great to have you. I'm super excited <laughs> to talk about this topic. I am definitely a bit of a, a space nerd. I've you know read the cosmos and the astrophysics for people in a hurry and these types of things. So really, thanks for your time and welcome to the podcast, John. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Thanks for having me on. Uh, um, and thanks in general for carrying on with this project. I think it's a pretty cool resource for the community. <laughs> Oh, thanks for the shout out. I'm glad to hear that you're enjoying it. Yeah, you said when we first started uh, chatting that you were familiar with the project, which makes me feel <laughs> happy. I think uh, we're trying our best to get it out to everybody. As tiny as the community may be, you know, as much as we can be a resource, that's great for us. So yeah, let's uh, get into this then. I think, of course, we have a million things we can discuss about the UV, UV coatings, but I think as many of the listeners may already know, we'll do a little bit of background on how you found yourself here at JPL and, and into this type of work. So yeah, uh, give us a little bit of a background of your time in, in ALD. How did you start working in the field and, and what's your kind of story on how you ended up working with NASA? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I guess it starts in grad school. Uh, my my background is in electrical engineering. Um, so I was at MIT working in a group that was doing kind of fundamental device research for uh, high performance CMOS applications. So uh, at that time in the early 2000s, there was a lot of interest in germanium as a possible uh, material um, to replace silicon, um, particularly in, in P-channel devices and, and CMOS logic applications. and. Um, so I was working in the clean room and, and that sort of thing. And, and uh, uh, that was about the time where ALD was really, um, you know, establishing itself as a, a, a semiconductor method, uh, particularly for depositing gate dielectric materials for the high K movement that was happening at that time. And working in germanium where uh, the, the main technical problem was the lack of a good native gate dielectric, it seemed like a, an obvious thing to try to move to a deposited gate dielectric. And ALD seemed to be the the right choice, um, you know, for, for getting these nanometer scale films. Um, we, uh, we did not have uh, ALD capabilities at that time, I think anywhere on, on the MIT campus where I was. Um, and we started a collaboration with the Roy Gordon Group at Harvard. Um, and so basically, we would we would take uh, uh, wafer material from from our lab at MIT up to Harvard, and 
and try out different gate dielectrics, different gate metals. They were working on a lot of of cool processes for materials like tungsten nitride and, and stuff like that. Um, and then come back and do the fab at MIT. And then uh, eventually, you know, it sort of worked well enough that we got interested enough in the technique to uh, at least get our hands on a, a small R&D tool to put in the clean room at MIT. And so that's kind of where I started to, with it, with ALD was, was via that route. Nice. So you were kind of establishing a bit than this uh, ALD technology, at least tool wise at MIT. Yeah. So it, it was a small commercial tool was, uh, from folks uh, from the Gordon group that started this uh, Cambridge nanotech company, which uh, I think a lot in the ALD community are, are familiar with that eventually uh, it was ultra tech. And then I think Vico owns them now, but they, they made those uh, small reactors. They called the Savannah series. And so that mm -hmm. was, that was the first one that was uh, in the MIT clean room anyway. And um, yeah, the, sort of myself and another grad student helped uh, install it and get it running and kind of qualify it for the, the work that we were interested in. I guess I've been hooked since then on on ALD. Nice. Yeah. What was it about the uh, the technology then that you know made you decide, yeah, this is what I'm going to keep going with? Yeah, it was just, uh, it was kind of new and different. Uh, you know, most of our our fab flow was uh, thermal oxide type stuff on on silicon and, and big oxidation chambers or typical uh, you know PCVD deposited dielectric stuff. Um, but then you know you get this ALD tool and you get these uh, perfect uniform depositions on you know we're working on six inch wafers at the time, but um, being able to deposit you know, two or three nanometers of film with uh, sub angstrom uniformity over these areas uh, seemed sort of magical. And the, the process itself always seems a little bit of magic uh, involved in the self-limiting nature of, of these reactions. And so not being a, a chemist, um, we were an electrical engineering group. It, it, there was a bit of wonder in the process, I guess. And it, um, that sort of aspect appealed to me. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I I find it to be one of the most satisfying techniques <laughs> I've ever ever seen in my life. Just just to get the TEM or the SEM image of the of the conformal film is so yeah, it just pleases the eye. It's for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's cool. Okay, so so now you're you're on West Coast. Did you you know move for for change of scenery? Was there already an opportunity? Were you there when you when you took the plane? No, really, I, I moved for family reasons. Um, I was following my wife out to the West Coast uh, and and looking for, you know, sort of small R and D kind of uh, work to get involved in, and was really just fortunate to land at JPL. I think again via my, a family connection, I was able to get a resume on the right person's desk at JPL and and start there as a postdoc actually. So. Um, that's how I got my foot in the door. That's amazing. Did you ever anticipate you might work for, for NASA, for JPL, be in this type of space? No, no pun intended, I, I, but... <laughs> no, and I, um, I mean, it certainly always appealed to me. I, I feel like I was always aware of, of Jet Propulsion Lab and Voyager and, and sort of the cool stuff they're, they're doing, Mars rovers and all that, but, um, before I'd moved out here, I'm not sure it would have even occurred to me to to look there for sort of semiconductor slash materials research roles, um, which is something I, I learned more about later on, obviously. But um, it ended up being a really nice fit. Uh, they they run a clean room facility at JPL called the Micro Devices Lab, which focuses a lot on detector technologies, but any any sort of associated materials um, and technologies along with it, and it's kind of an academic style clean room, and in some sense, it's not a it's not a CMOS fab, um, and and so it encompasses all of these you know small R and D projects, but also people building flight detectors for space telescopes and cool stuff like that. So uh, it was it was a good place to land for sure. Cool. So. And before we get into the work that you're doing there now, um, could you just give a little 
background about how JPL and NASA are related? What's the, what's the relationship with the two entities? Yeah, so uh, JPL is a FFRDC, a federally funded research and development center uh, that's managed by Caltech for NASA. So uh, we're considered a NASA center, but we're different from all the other NASA centers in that we're, we're not civil servants at, at JPL. Mm -hmm. So the other centers like uh, Goddard and and Johnson and Kennedy are are all basically civil servant employees that are work for the U.S. government. Uh, we're more of a model like uh, Lincoln Labs or or Argon, um, where um, a, a separate entity essentially manages us for NASA. So um, it's a little bit different in that way. Okay, got you. So it's not. Okay, so NASA is not like you know pulling pulling the strings necessarily, but closely, um, I imagine working together with everybody at JPL, common goals yeah, and so these types of things. The way it sort of broadly works is uh, NASA owns all the stuff and all the buildings, so they mm -hmm. you know own all the reactors and everything like that. But we're all employees of Caltech. Um, and then the the majority of the the funding that comes into JPL is certainly via NASA. Uh, a lot of it is via large directed funding for flagship space missions like the Mars rovers and stuff like that. But um, another large portion of it is is all soft competed funding, which again mostly ends up going through NASA just because that's relevant to the the work a lot of us are doing. But uh, it's this mix of sort of big space missions and then these smaller R and D programs. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, I think maybe people have heard of of you know the phrase NASA's JPL or stuff like this, or I don't know, maybe they've you know, watched Mark Rober on on YouTube or something like this and have have heard it there. Uh, but see, I don't know if it's. I mean, even myself wasn't really quite sure how the how the relationship works. So that's really really interesting to know. That's more of like a a national lab that kind of serves interests or, you know, are in the same, same application areas. So um, I, I imagine that's maybe a little bit more, more freeing, maybe a little less bureaucratic than if you were working in the uh, actual civil servant centers that they have. Yeah, it, I think it is. And, uh, and at least I get the impression that the, you know, NASA likes that organizational relationship and, um, you know, I think it works out well for other federal agencies like DOE and, um, just from a, a contracting point of view, which I don't know anything about, but, um, um, you know, we're, we're a little bit isolated from some of the direct, uh, congressional budget issues and government shutdown things that sometimes stop our colleagues at, at other NASA centers from working you know, one day to the next, if there's a government shutdown, whereas we have like a little bit of buffer essentially based on, on our funding profile. That government shutdown is topical <laughs> yeah. conversation right now, <laughs> but uh, in any case, I imagine you know, everybody in Europe maybe is not paying that much attention to those things. Anyway, uh, mo moving on to what you are actually doing at uh, JPL then. So, um, I can't remember off your profile how long you've been there. Maybe it was, it was 10 years or so, but um, you're working on, on ultraviolet coatings, ALD uh, of such. And I think it's a super, super interesting topic. And I don't know why for me, it feels, it feels really, really elegant. Maybe it's just the fact that, you know, it is, these things are going to space, but um, I think it's really, um, really neat one to to talk about. So you just give us like a little brief synopsis of what the work is you're doing at GPL. Sure. Um, it uh, So first of all, it, it's sort of like most uh, R&D projects spun out of other efforts that were already ongoing at JPL. So uh, I joined a group led by Shalane Nixad, who, who, who led a team doing UV detector development. Um, and and basically there and this is still work that goes on uh, at JPL. There there's a process there that involves uh, back surface modification of silicon sensors, uh, so sensors like CCDs or, or CMOS imagers, um, which typically don't have good sensitivity at ultraviolet wavelengths. But 
if you if you thin them down from the back of the device and and do this back surface passivation in the right way, you can make devices that operate with with high uh, UV quantum efficiency. Um, um, sort of a competitor, I guess, to a topic that you recently discussed with Jeff Elam uh, at Argon, uh, who's worked on on microchannel plates, which are kind of the the standard UV detector for a lot of space applications. Let's take uh, let's take um, a large uh, flat sheet of, of glass that has pores going through it um, that has the right um, you know physical uh, structure to be a microchannel plate, but doesn't have the electronic properties that you need, the high resistance and the secondary electron emissive properties. And let's impart those properties using ALD coatings. So this is sort of a, a solid state alternative to those microchannel plate detectors. And they uh, so they they've been doing this for for 20 plus years now at JPL this detector work and and started to get to the point where they wanted to develop more complex uh, anti reflection and filter coatings to go on the the backside of these back illuminated devices because they were interested in working at shorter and shorter wavelengths they um started to move away from sort of the conventional optical coating materials like silicon oxide and hafnium oxide and stuff like that and start looking at the fluoride materials. And then uh, maybe long story short, uh, ALD kind of emerged as, as, you know, I don't want to say it's definitely the best way to deposit these coatings on, on the devices, but um, in, in a lot of ways, it was the easiest and the way that the coating could be applied without damaging the underlying detector. And so um, some of the prior work at JPL involved uh, sputtering these coatings or e-beam evaporation, and it would have the side effect of, of depassivating the, the back surface and sort of disrupting the, the passivation work that just happened before the coating went down. Whereas uh, at least thermal ALD is, is almost always gentle enough to preserve the, uh, the performance of the underlying detector. And so uh, these ALD facilities existed at JPL when I got there, but there was just sort of this emerging interest in, in moving to these shorter wavelengths and, and trying to work with fluoride materials instead of oxides. Uh, and although there, there had been a fair amount of, of fluoride work in the ALD literature at that point, um, it wasn't sort of, uh, it wasn't mainstream for sure, and it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't uh, applicable to kind of all the materials that we were interested in, which tend to be things like mag fluoride, aluminum fluoride, lithium fluoride. And that's uh, that's when we started looking at these alternate chemical routes to depositing some of these fluoride materials with the, the HF work. Okay, great. So yeah, the, the kind of main one that's being looked at a lot now is, is lithium fluoride. So um, yeah, what what is it about lithium fluoride that makes it such a good a good UV UV coating? Yeah, so all of these materials have have trade offs, and the primary trade off for uh, um, any optical system, I guess, whether you're talking about putting this on a detector or putting this on a mirror, is the short wavelength cutoff. And so there's a progression in the in the optical band energy of these materials as you move from something like mag fluoride, which starts to cut off strongly around 120 nanometers, uh, down to aluminum fluoride, which maybe buys you another five nanometers or so of, of wavelength range. And then lithium fluoride is, is probably the highest uh, um, band energy for kind of a, a stable dielectric um, coating material and can Get you a coating that could work effectively closer to 100 nanometers and these sound like pretty small steps in in wavelength but uh as you move through these short wavelengths you cross a lot of of uh spectral diagnostic lines that are of a lot of interest to astronomers um, to people studying astrophysics and planetary science um and it has everything to do with mostly with the um um, the series of hydrogen transition lines, most of the universe is hydrogen. So you, you move through these lines as you approach the ground state energy of hydrogen, which is around 90 nanometers. 
so every every few nanometers you can recover as you as you get towards that goal uh, ends up being important and allows you to you know sell your instrument or your uh, mission mm -hmm. concept to the right people so okay so you're you're getting closer and closer basically to being able to see the special lines of of everything right or maybe everything is a bit of a stretch but to, to yeah. no one elements as small as we we think we can go with, with hydrogen transitions uh, <clears throat> so let's take like a like a, a telescope system or or something like this that's going up to do some imaging of course i you know wrote down james webb because that was the most recent thing that probably everybody is familiar with but if you were you're thinking about this type of system, I mean, there's the the actual image sensors. There's tons of mirrors on it. Um, so where where do these UV coatings go though? Um, are they are they only on the mirrors? Are they only on the detectors? And um, if they're everywhere, how do they kind of work in synergy? Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that they certainly could be everywhere. Um, uh, so yeah, there's the this interesting problem in the UV where basically all optimal optical materials are lossy to some extent, and so uh, mirrors don't have perfect reflectivity, and you're limited in, in the kinds of materials that you can use to make a UV mirror. Really, your only choice is aluminum um, when you get down into these wavelength range, um, and so. The, the problem with all of this instrumentation is is recovering that loss. And so the loss comes from the oxidation of the aluminum that you're using to to make the mirrors out of. And so you you want to put a transparent protective coating on top of of the aluminum to to make a high performance mirror. And so that's why you would coat aluminum with mag fluoride or, or lithium fluoride. They if you're using a solid state detector, like uh, our team would prefer, um, you can make uh, you can make these devices with 100% internal quantum efficiency now, but uh, you wanna recover as much of the reflection loss as you can. And so that means putting an anti-reflection coating down or some sort of specialty uh, filter coating, which are, are all gonna involve these fluoride materials. You might have, uh, beam splitters in your telescope. If you're trying to image over two different channels, for example. And so that, that beam splitter is, is functionally a, a dielectric mirror coating that is going to be made out of fluoride thin film materials. Um, and so all of it is about, is about chasing uh, efficiency and that's the name of the game. And in, in the UV, um, it's certainly, it's less of an issue for, a telescope like James Webb or or systems that operate at visible or um, visible or near infrared wavelengths, just because it's so easy to find coding materials and reflective materials that operate with with high efficiencies at at those wavelengths. And so, typically, a a visible wavelength telescope would operate with uh, an end to end throughput efficiency, you know, of at least fifty percent, but it could be as high as 80 or 90%. And a, a UV telescope, after you get through three or four reflections and your detector efficiency and beam splitters, fold mirrors, whatever else you have in your system, they typically operate with end-to-end -end efficiencies on the order of a uh, single digit percent. Okay. Wow. So there's, there's a lot of room you could potentially make up if you could improve the performance of, of all of these coatings. So then, okay, James Webb is up there doing doing visible spectrum things. Do we have any any satellites or like current projects that are working with these these UV coatings with fluoride coatings? Well, so the the last big one, of course, is Hubble Space Telescope, which has been mm -hmm. up there for for a few decades now, and mm -hmm. so that's kind of the the workhorse uh, UV telescope for um, that you know astronomers across the world can can access and put in proposals for observation time. There's, uh, aside from those big projects, there's lots of, of small projects that are interested in the UV. Um, and a lot of that has been motivated by what people are, are starting to wonder will be the eventual successor to, to Hubble. Um, I think people know that Hubble's not gonna last forever. And so, 
um, there's at least a, a push now to, um, you know, figure out what the next flagship UV space telescope might look like. And in order to do that, there's there's a lot of smaller missions and smaller telescopes that, that come before it. Oh, so then what's the limitation on, on Hubble right now in terms of, okay, when it was launched, where have we kind of been improved that if we if we could today launch a analogous telescope, um, yeah, how much how much better would the the image quality or how much more would we be able to see? Yeah, some of it is is wavelength range. Uh, Hubble is is mag fluoride protected aluminum mirrors. So for for most of the things they look at, they're limited to that 120 nanometer cutoff, and so a lot of the concepts that have been floated anyway consider switching that protective coating material to lithium fluoride to get at those shorter wavelengths. Um, and so that's been an active area. There, there are problems, of course, with uh, lithium fluoride in terms of its environmental stability. And so answering those questions and, and answering whether you could actually put it on a, a large space telescope and survive in the way that the, the Hubble mirror coatings have is, is kind of the key question with, with lithium fluoride. But um, aside from the mirror coatings, you know, everything else technology wise has, has per improved since the Hubble days, um, micro channel plate detectors have certainly come a long way, both in their noise performance and their quantum efficiency and these solid state detectors that, that we're working on at JPL have, have done the same thing. And so the combination of all these efficiency improvements, plus the possibility of making a telescope that is maybe more web sized than than Hubble sized, but operating in the UV is pretty intriguing to a lot of people. Well, yeah, this is <laughs> I'm geeking out a little bit. I'm I'm sorry if it is you know tacky because you, you talk about these things with people all day, but I <laughs> I don't get the opportunity. So before we continue, I just thank you for indulging me sure. <laughs> in all of this. Um, yeah, I think my question about the, the AOD coding is if you're looking to get something that has really good uniformity, say, okay, this is going to, could pose some problems in uh, uh, future, future telescope applications, like how, how much uniformity difference starts to become a problem? Are we talking like, you know, a nanometer difference across, uh, across a mirror is, is too much to, um, get a good good image quality or is it you know, a couple nanometers and what's what's the scale on that yeah i mean it's it's on the order of a nanometer that the number that people throw around is is a one percent uh variation in reflectance uniformity which i i think trades back to sort of that nanometer scale and and so that's on the order maybe of a few percent film thickness variation across your mirror and um, the the larger reason that that these uniformity numbers become important is is because a lot of these well uh, certainly the future flagship telescope that a, a lot of people are interested in and the one that was recommended by the recent astrophysics decadal survey the desire to perform um, visible wavelength coronography to look at at Earth like exoplanets and and these systems are 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 so sensitive that they're, you know, need to be um, basically, uh, you need to minimize all, all sources of air in your, in your optical system in order to drive down the, the ultimate performance of these coronagraph systems. And um, the, the coronagraph instruments themselves are very complex. They have deformable mirrors that can correct uh, aberrations in your reflected wavefront and, and things like that. But they can only do so much work and they only have so much of a, a total error budget that you don't want to eat up by having these gross non-uniformities in your in your mirror systems. So it's it's really that that coronography aspect that is trickles back down to pushing in the requirements on the mirrors themselves. Okay. Yeah, very, very small <laughs> aberrations then. Yeah, I can you know, understand why. Um that the surface smoothie stuff L3 Harris was interested in would also be of uh, a relevance here. 
anything more than you know, a couple of angstroms of roughness, I'm sure at these wavelengths also are, are pretty detrimental then if one nanometer across the whole thing could be performance degrading. Yeah, it's it's mind boggling stuff to me. I, I'm not an optical engineer, but uh, the systems that are, are being discussed um, for concepts uh, that like Louvoir, it used to be called Louvoir and um, Habex and and so what ended up happening is that a Cato survey recommended sort of a, uh, a combination of those two missions, if you will, or something that that uh, looks like a combination of them anyway. Um, and uh, and now people are, are, are trying to figure out, you know, what that architecture will, will ultimately look like. That'll happen over the next year or two. But um, even as part of those previous studies for, for Louvoir, for example, they would talk about uh, picometer uh, stability of, of the mirror segments that make up these large segmented uh, telescope systems. So they have, you know, active control over the, the shape of the mirror segments and the position of the segments relative to each other. Um, and it's all <laughs> complex, crazy stuff that I couldn't begin to explain, but it, um, it gives you the idea of of why uh, people would worry about the the mirror reflectance at the percent level. That's insane. I optical some of the optical stuff also way over my head. Uh, I feel like even for some optical engineers, maybe it's <laughs> maybe they don't even know what's what's going on in any case. But uh, oh, cool. So uh, I just have maybe maybe one more question about uh, about, about logistic type stuff because I want to do. I want to ask one question about the decadal survey because I've, I've heard it thrown around before, but also I'm not quite familiar with it. But yeah, uh, it's about more like the feasibility and, and how you test the test the coding. So, you know, you have so far to go, I imagine, from doing an R&D scale coding just to see, okay, does this have the optical performance that we want to it actually being put onto a mirror that's going onto a telescope that's going to go to space. So what are the kind of boxes that you need to tick before you like, okay, this is something we actually can use and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And um, it has everything to do with what NASA calls technology readiness level. And so um, even at the sort of formulation stage of these future mission concepts, they they do a sort of a realistic survey of, of the technologies that are available and, and assign them uh, a level they think is fair. So Louvoir, for example, did baseline lithium fluoride protected aluminum mirrors uh, as part of its telescope and then assign them a TRL level of three out of nine, basically nine being something that's flown in space before and is exactly what you want to do again. And three is kind of like at the, the proof of concept lab level, which is, is probably a fair assessment in that people certainly haven't built a, a Louvoir sized mirror segment out of some of these new uh, lithium fluoride processes, whether it's by ALD or, or the hot PVD method, but they've built lab prototypes, um, you know, that, that might only be a couple inches in diameter. That's that's probably enough to say it's a TRL three, and there's a realistic engineering pathway to to get to these bigger systems. And so from there, it's all about um, sort of defining the the benchmarks that you think are needed to get to those higher levels. But also, it's important to demonstrate them on on smaller systems. And so most of the people doing technology work in this area collaborate with, with other groups at universities or other NASA centers who operate smaller missions, whether it's in the astrophysics world or the, the planetary science world. These are, are things like sounding rockets, which uh, just launch high up into the atmosphere and then come back down for a, for a 10 minute observation or uh, CubeSats have certainly grown in popularity over the last 10 years. And now there's even uh, astrophysics CubeSats, which which people, I think 10 years ago, I didn't think was a really good idea. They weren't sure what kind of actual astrophysics science you could do with a, a CubeSat. But um, 
if you have a really targeted observation that you're looking to do or something you really want to prove, then it's a nice platform to do it. And it's also a great platform to test out some of these new technologies because now you don't need to code a, a mirror, a meter plus segment for Louvoir. You can code a, a 10 inch mirror that can fit into a CubeSat with the same, you know, coding processes that you envision will be used on on your larger mirror, but then actually launch it into space and see how it degrades on orbit and that kind of thing. So it's, it's the on orbit validation and then all of the laboratory testing that goes along with it, which includes radiation testing and environmental testing and all that kind of stuff. So how, how long or what's a representative amount of time then if you send something up in a cube set um, that's okay. Is it a you know a couple couple months to stay in orbit, and then we go, okay, that's that's good enough. That should be that should be um, long enough for us to know that it'll go for a, a year or two or something. If it was if it was launched later, is there some kind of threshold for that? I assume you can't do it in perpetuity. So, yeah, no, that I mean that that's about the right time scale. Uh, most of these cubesats have uh, mission lifetimes of months to maybe up to a year or in some cases, maybe two years. But yeah, the uh, I think all CubeSats that are in low earth orbit have to deorbit uh, within some threshold amount of time. So, but it's on the order of a year, let's say. Um, but that's depending on how the, you know, instrument is set up, that's enough time to kind of validate what you want to do. And the whole idea is that you're, you know, you're putting the mirrors through the same sort of validation process that you would do for the the bigger mission, but just on a on a smaller scale. So I have to at this point give a quick shout out to my my alum to see you Boulder. Because I know that you guys at JPL are doing some kind of collaboration with uh some guys at CU Boulder, or Kevin France and some some others. And I think that's on some some CubeSat stuff, right? Sprite, if I'm remembering correctly, was the the mission. That's, yeah, that's right. Um, and so, um, yeah, we work with uh, the guys at CU Boulder quite a bit. Um, it's sort of uh, it's sort of interesting, I guess. So, with Steve George being at at Boulder and the <laughs> the ALD guru, uh, um, and then sort of circuitously working. Uh, um, back with CU Boulder on the astrophysics side. Uh, um, but yeah, we work with uh, Kevin France and uh, Brian Fleming is the PI of the Sprite CubeSat mission. We've worked with Kevin on some sounding rocket missions that have used some of our codings. But the yeah, the way those work is that, you know, folks like Kevin or Brian come up with the, the science case that they're interested in. And they've been motivated a lot by these short wavelength applications that require lithium fluoride and there therefore they have a vested interest in in seeing those coding technologies mature um, so they've been good supporters of the work um, but they they get proposed to nasa technology programs and then selected for funding and so a, a sounding rocket you, you might be able to put together that instrument in a year or two um, before it launches, the CubeSats tend to be a little bit more complex and are maybe like three, four year programs. But yeah, they're again, good platforms to, to demonstrate the technology that you're interested in. Sprite in particular is an interesting case because uh, Brian has thought a lot about these, these mirror coatings. And so Sprite actually, so it has the primary mirrors and, and other optics coated with this lithium fluoride material, but then it has a, a separate calibration channel on the CubeSat with the mag fluoride protected aluminum mirror coatings that are sort of an off the shelf coating. So they can do a sort of real world uh, apples to apples comparison of, of how these coatings are, are degrading on orbit. Um, so that'll be cool to see. We've, we've, uh, this is a project uh, on the mirror coding side that involves uh, PVD work at Goddard Space Flight Center. And then, um, so they're depositing the aluminum and the lithium fluoride layer by PVD. And then we're putting a thin ALD mag fluoride cap layer on top of it in this case. And the, the idea was to uh, make that mag fluoride layer thin enough that 
it wouldn't affect the optical performance of the lithium fluoride coating, but um, thick enough that it could seal in some of the environmental stability and we wouldn't mm -hmm. see the reflectance loss that you usually see in, in lithium fluoride. And so the, the ground tests for, for these coatings look really promising. So hopefully that'll launch next year sometime. Super cool. We're going to have to keep our, our eye up for it then. Great. Well, John, this has been, been so much fun. I, yeah, I, you know, my, my brain is completely bursting <laughs> with joy right now. Yeah. I have just, you know, one, one or two like questions. I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I'm sure you have a busy day ahead of you, but we mentioned the, the decadal survey a couple of times. And um, it was also something that came up when I was doing this work in, in grad school as well. And I remember hearing Louvoir also a couple of times. This was now in 20, 2020, I think I was hearing this, um, which I guess makes sense. It was it was on the decade because you just give a little bit of info about uh, what this decadal survey mission concepts are. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and coming from outside of uh, um, sort of the space technology world, it was new to me as well. But uh, um, so all the major science uh, branches of NASA and the National Science Foundation that are interested in ground-based uh, observatories conduct these decadal surveys. So they happen in planetary science, they happen in uh, Earth science, they happen in astrophysics, and they're they're all kind of offset from each other. But the, the astrophysics one is the one that uh, was supposed to be completed in 2020. That it was delayed until 2021 because of COVID. But uh, it's this process by which um, basically the entire astrophysics community comes together and sort of put their heads together to decide what the future direction for NASA and NSF uh, in this case should be in terms of, in particular, in terms of, of the large uh, projects that uh, they might consider going forward. And so this is the, the mechanism by which uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was recommended and James Webb um, and the, the next big astrophysics flagship will be uh, the Roman Space Telescope, which uh, is being constructed right now. That's a wide field infrared telescope. Um, but it, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, and so what, so what happens is uh, uh, concepts for these large missions emerge and then eventually become formalized as a mission concept. And NASA provides some funding to study these in more detail. And so in the last survey, they considered four flagship mission concepts. Two were UV space telescopes, the HabEx and LUHOR that I mentioned. And then there was a, there was a far infrared telescope uh, and an X-ray telescope that were part of the same concept study essentially. And then, uh, all these reports get generated and then digested by the decadal survey panel, which is made up of teams of uh, astronomers across the country. Um, it's organized by the National Academies. And they, they make a recommendation essentially to NASA and to Congress, uh, you know, what, what direction should be made. Um, and so the recommendation was essentially to do something which which looks like Louvoir with the sort of explicit goal of, of doing this coronography work to try to detect uh, Earth-like planets orbiting sun-like stars uh, with this future space telescope. That was sort of the one science thing that, that got everybody's attention. Um, and so that recommendation was made, and now we start to begin this process of, of well, how do you execute that recommendation? Uh, what does it really look like? The recommendation wasn't so explicit that it says it looks exactly like this Louvoir concept. Um, we know it'll look something like that, but um, really it'll end up looking like something in between Louvoir and HabEx. And so over the next year or two, sort of the teams will reconvene and start to hash out um, what they're now calling the Habitable Worlds Observatory will look like. And then uh, in the intervening decade, essentially there'll be a, a lot of technology development work, pending congressional approval and all that sort of stuff uh, with the hope that 
uh, something could come together and launch probably in the 2030s timeframe. So that gives you the idea of sort of the life cycle of these space technologies is that, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of our interest in the UV was, was motivated by this coming decadal survey in 2020. So a lot of technology work that NASA funded in the, in the, you know, 20 teens was, was geared towards these UV applications. Um, and, and so now, now that that, path has been set that there is going to be some sort of UV telescope, uh, people recognize there's still a lot more work to do. And that'll, that'll be what happens over the next five to 10 years. That, that's really interesting. It's nice to hear, though, that it's kind of, uh, you know, the direction is, is almost crowdsourced by, by the community. It's not just a couple of people, you know, sitting in a room to yeah. say, yeah, this is the way it's going to go for the next 10 years that that's really a lot of input and, and foresight and thought that actually goes into, okay, how is space technology going to proceed for the foreseeable yeah. future? No, that's pretty neat. Uh, and, the, you know, there obviously people put a lot of effort into defining these mission concepts that go into the report. I mean, they take uh, two or three years to put together, but they're, they're generally, you know, aren't sore losers if, you're, if your thing isn't isn't selected there's there's pretty good uh, rationale over you know how these panels make their decision and that sort of thing so it's, it's sort of a neat way to do it i think very nice well, yeah thanks again john for for all of this cool insight and information um, this is one of the conversations i've really been most looking forward to so i'm really really glad that you had the time and were interested in being part of this project so thank you so much again for for coming on and, and being part of our podcast, John. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. It was yeah, fun. absolutely. Uh, just one more question before you go. I, I won't keep you keep you too much longer. I just I'm really interested to hear what are you like most looking forward to then over the next few years in your work, and um, yeah, maybe if there's something that you're going to see from your lab going up to the stratosphere or space. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, we we we'd like to keep making progress on these mirror coatings. We'd like to um, have more ALD based solutions for a lot of these uh, UV instrumentation problems. So we're we're looking at uh, dielectric mirror coatings and and beam splitter type coatings now too, and see if there's a role that ALD can play there. Um, the detector coatings in particular have have been a main interest of mine, and so. Those are, are certainly attractive because there's a lot of interest in the detectors themselves, and this offers a way to take a, a broadband silicon imaging sensor and make it into a, a narrowband UV sensor. So we we have uh, a number of other projects that involve the detectors. There's a, another CubeSat mission called Sparks, which uh, is sort of being put together right now. That's out of uh, Arizona State. And then uh, one that I'm more involved with is a, uh, a larger astrophysics mission called UVEX. So as, as you go to smaller missions away from the flagship missions, um, these tend to be competed missions. In other words, uh, NASA just issues a call for proposals and, and anyone can put together a, a mission concept that fits within some budget box that, that NASA defines. And so they have a small explorer program they call it and a medium explorer program that come out every few years so this mission called uvex which is is led by caltech uh was selected for a concept study last year and so that's what we've been working on a lot over the last year and that involves some some interesting filter coatings on the detectors that we do by ald including uh, an, an interesting graded thickness coating that uh, we're depositing on uh, a sensor that's part of a spectrograph on that instrument. The idea is to tune the, the performance of the anti-reflection coating uh, across the device so that it, it matches the dispersion that you get in the spectrometer, which um, um, you might think is is not a good use case for for ALD, but we've sounds tough. <laughs> we've been working on some some interesting ways to make uh, graded coatings that are, are sort of neat anyway um, that we could use on on this UVEX mission. So we hope that gets selected to move forward to to implementation. 
Nice. Well, looking forward to seeing what comes out. If you can get that to work with the ALD, I'm really happy to read about it. Sure. Well, yeah. Well, thanks again, John. This was really a blast. I, I appreciate your time. And yeah, I don't know, will you be going to any conferences, ALD conference, maybe in Bellevue this year? Yeah, I'm certainly uh, trying to pull together some abstracts for, for next week for that. Uh, but yeah, we'll, I think we'll be there. I, I certainly plan to attend. Great. Sounds good. Well, I'll, I'll look forward to connecting with you there then in a few months. It'll be nice to meet you in person. Yeah, you too. Yeah. If you end up in the LA SoCal area, definitely let me know. I'd be happy to show you around lab. That Lots of be... cool non-ALD stuff happening here, as you can uh, imagine. <laughs> that would be so, so cool. Uh, almost a, a dream come true, probably. So All right. yeah. And same, same if you happen to find yourself in, in Helsinki and want to see the, the Bennett clean room. <laughs> <laughs> you can truly make that happen although it may all not right. be as interesting but yeah. well, i'd be interested <laughs> <laughs> all right well thanks again john um well then have a great rest of the uh the week john a good weekend and yeah hopefully we'll get to see you in a few months then in bellevue okay yeah good to talk to you all right thanks a lot john take care bye-bye bye thanks for listening to ald stories with benick to stay updated on new episodes each month please follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. We hope you enjoyed the show. I hope to see you again in the next one.